So let's talk about what our scientific definition of a fluid is. So when we look at it, the biggest difference between a fluid and a solid is that as you push on a solid, it's going to deform and then stop. So let's take a look at this and I'm just going to draw a chunk of solid. Doesn't matter what it is. It's a block of name, whatever your favorite solid is. And then I will apply a shear stress to the top of it and be yanking on it. So what's going to happen? Well, it's going to sit there and it's going to deform. And it's going to deform by some angle. And we'll call that angle theta. And what we do know from our strength of material classes, that as long as we're within the linear elastic region, we can sit there and calculate out and say that, okay, well, my shear stress is going to be equal to the constant of proportionality, our modulus of rigidity, times that angle that we're dealing with. And that's it. We have an in initial deformation. It stops. And the important thing is we have a finite deformation. That means that we apply the load, it deforms, we let go of the load, and it springs back. And once again, that's as long as we're in the linear elastic region. We can plastically deform it, and it won't spring back all the way, but it will start to spring back. <clears throat> now, as opposed to that, let's look at a chunk of fluid. Now, this is a mythological, it's a theoretical chunk of fluid, because obviously we can't drop a glob of fluid there and have it be in a rectangle. But once again, we're going to apply that shear stress to the fluid, and what happens? Well, it starts to deform. The thing is, it keeps deforming. And it just keeps deforming. And it will keep deforming as long as we hold that shear stress on there as we increase time. The fluid will continue to deform. So now we have this situation where we're set up that we do not have a finite deformation, we have a continuous deformation. Let's see, did I spell that right? Yes, it looks like it has too many U's, but it doesn't. I'm a horrendously bad speller, so I'm constantly questioning myself. So we have a continuous deformation as long as force is applied. As long as force is applied. And so this is what we get into the big definition between. Let me change this because I noticed that it's in a red, and that's probably not the best thing. We'll go to a dark blue. So as long as we're applying a force, we're going to have a continuous deformation. And so what that gets us to is the scientific, di uh, scientific uh, definition of what a fluid is, and that basically comes down to a solid can resist shear by static deformation a fluid cannot so if we want to look at it what is the definition of a fluid basically a fluid is a phase of matter that cannot resist shear forces. Okay, so let's go and take a look. We talked about the three phases of matter. What I do want to talk about is the first hypothesis that we will have in fluids. And so it's a model for studying fluid and solid behavior in terms of averaging properties. And so what we're going to do is average properties of small volumes containing large molecules. And we're going to assume that these properties are assumed to vary smoothly through the fluid. So this is what's known as the continuum hypothesis. And so basically what I've just said in English is when, we ha when we're operating under the continuum hypothesis, the variation in properties in a fluid are so smooth that differential calculus can be used to analyze the substance.
<clears throat> this is not what's really going on in real life. So if you look out into a body of water like Buzzard's Bay, the properties will vary chaotically through it. So, at some points you can have temperature that will be one degree warmer than the temperature right directly next to it. But when we start looking at things in, an ag in a huge scale, we can pretty much make the assumption that, hey, these properties, if the temperature is, say, 80 degrees in the air and then the water is 70 degrees, the water is going to vary from 70 degrees at the top to maybe 60 degrees 30 feet down, and it's going to vary in a linear progression. And that hypothesis works out really well when we're dealing with fluids, as long as the hypothesis is valid. So when is the continuum hypothesis valid? When can we use it? And we really have two situations where we can do that. The first one is when the fluid volume is much smaller than the physical system. And the physical system. So this is where you're dealing with something like a pump. The uh, physical system itself is much greater than the fluid volume. Um, the second thing that we need for the fluid, uh, the continuum hypothesis to be valid, is that the fluid volume is much greater than the average space between. Much greater and the average space between the molecules. This basically just means that you have a volume that's got a lot of molecules in it. So the continuum uh, hypothesis does break down in a couple of situations. Uh, where they would break down would be, the first one would be what's called a hard vacuum. So a hard vacuum is basically space. So why does the continuum hypothesis break down under a hard vacuum? Well, if we look at it, what is the scientific definition of space? Well, space is two to four atoms per square kilometer. And so now we run into the, oh, excuse me, that is not kilometer, that is square mile. Makes a slight difference, but still, the intermolecular spacing is very, very large relative to the amount of fluid that we have in there, so that ends up being a problem. And so the continuum hypothesis would not work in a hard vacuum. That does not mean that there aren't fluid problems in a hard vacuum. You actually have to carry out air drag calculations on the International Space Station because there are those two to four atoms per mile square, so we have that problem. The second place that the continuum hypothesis breaks down is something called hypersonic flow. So I'm sure that you're, you've seen some kind of movie and the, the planes are going supersonic especially a, a great movie from the 80s like Top Gun. So supersonic is any time that you're traveling faster than the speed of sound. And we'll actually talk about that later in the class, what's going on. What hypersonic is, is hypersonic is traveling five times the speed of sound. Let's make that a times and not a plus. So you're traveling five times the speed of sound. And so what happens is the fluid is no longer flowing like a continuum. You can actually solve these problems, but you're solving them as point particle problems and not fluid problems. So you're actually calculating it out where you're throwing molecules of fluid against something and having it bounce. Third place that would break down is would be in nano applications. So we're talking about some place where the average space between the molecules compared to the number of molecules is quite large. 
So the bad news when the continuum hypothesis breaks down is that you have to use statistical mechanics to solve the problems. Statistical mechanics are fun, but it's very hard. It's kind of some nasty math. It's, it's some pretty hardcore stuff. Now, the good news is, is non-valid continuum, non continuum assumption fluids problems are way beyond the scope of this class. And, and truthfully, it's pretty much beyond the scope of probably 99.9% .9 of all industrial applications. And that is all we have. The next thing that we will talk about will be systems of units.